remember that moment when you were about 11 years old and your parents sat you down with this strange, sharp object and taught you how to scrape it all over your body? I certainly remember. I had just started middle school and I was rocking a really cute pair of Bermuda shorts, but I came home crying that day because my classmates had made fun of my hairy legs. I told my mother, it is time to fix this problem right now. She bought me a razor and taught me how to shave my legs and armpits, leaving my skin silky smooth. Actually, it, it was a little bit bloody. Um, but for the next eight years of my life, shaving was practically my religion. Two to three times a week, I woke up extra early to give myself time to perform the ritual meticulously shaving every square inch of my legs and armpits, nobly fighting off razor burn, ingrown hairs, and the difficulty of navigating the back of your knees. <laughs> the constant nagging from my mother to wax your eyebrows, wax your mustache, wax your bikini line. But as much as I hated all of this, I never even considered the alternative. Not shaving was like, absolutely taboo. I thought it was something that only hippies and feminists did. At least before I realized I was definitely both of those things. <laughs> and my story is not unique. In the United States today, over 99% of women remove their hair. Shaving is the most commonly used method, followed by waxing and creams and lotions. In the average American woman's lifetime, she will spend over two months just removing her hair. Those who shave will spend $10,000 on the practice in a lifetime. Those who wax, $23,000. Now, in my sophomore year of college, I pretty much got fed up with the amount of time, money, and effort that shaving was costing me. With the encouragement of my roommate, I managed to put down the razor for six months. Now, I thought that I would be bothered by the presence of hair on my legs and armpits, but in reality, I was relieved to just be okay with my body for once. I celebrated my thick brown locks for the first time since middle school. I never even hesitated to wear a sleeveless top or a short skirt, even though I definitely got stared at. Like a ridiculous amount of stares from moms and their kids in the grocery store, from other college kids at parties, even from professors at office hours. But even though I experienced the stigma of body hair almost immediately, I still began to question every second I had ever spent shaving. What started as a ex social experiment in hairiness kind of turned into this intense curiosity. If having body hair really doesn't affect your life all that much, why are 99% of us still enduring this misery? Is having smooth skin really worth all that trouble? I decided to dive in and investigate the history of American women's body hair removal in order to investigate its causes and its consequences. Now, of course, this talk is not going to be all-encompassing. There still isn't much to say about the way that race, gender, and class affect body hair removal practices. Most of the available research on the topic focuses on middle and upper class white cisgender women. And I'll be the first to admit that I am far from an expert on this topic. I'm just a very furry college student who has struggled with shaving my entire life and wants to know what the deal is. So let's jump in, and hopefully you won't be pulling your hair out by the end. <laughs> so the history of body hair removal in America is intimately tied to the history of fashion. In the early 1900s, women were largely covered up from collarbone to ankle. So hair removal practices were few and far between. In the year 1915, the first sleeveless dresses came onto the market, and advertisers began this guerrilla campaign to banish underarm hair. They marketed it as a way to keep up with the fashion of the day. One advertisement from that period shows a woman with her arms above her head in a sleeveless dress. The text reads, the woman of fashion says the underarm must be as smooth as the face. But these advertisers were alerting women to a problem that they didn't even know they had. By marketing underarm hair as unwanted, unclean, and unfashionable, these companies were expanding their potential markets like crazy. In the 1950s, skirt lengths got shorter and bathing suits came into style, so these advertisers started targeting the legs as well, and not just to keep up with the style of the day. Advertisements from this period read things like, 
man's eye view. Or let's look at your legs, everyone else does. Hairlessness suddenly became synonymous with sexuality and men's pleasure in addition to style. By the year 1964, 98% of women were shaving their legs, and the number has only continued to grow since then. New hair removal technologies make it possible to remove more and more hair. Today, 64% of women between the ages of 18 and 24 even remove all of their pubic hair regularly. Now, this would have been unheard of 30 years ago, but thanks to Victoria's Secret, the porn industry, and one notorious episode of Sex in the City, the Brazilian wax is now the gold standard of hair removal. And pubic hair on women is largely considered to be dirty and unfeminine by both sexes. Kim Kardashian has been quoted as saying that the only place a woman should have hair is on her head, while Victoria Beckham has announced that she thinks the Brazilian wax should be mandatory starting at age 15. I know. But all this history still begs the $10,000 question. Why? Why did American women jump on this expensive, time-consuming, and painful bandwagon so wholeheartedly? There are many theories that attempt to uncover the root of it. Some have argued that body hair removal is just one part of the American obsession with cleanliness. That's the view that the natural human body is disgusting. This manifests itself in our need to cover up our body odor and attempt to prevent aging. You may have even heard the rumor that if you don't shave your underarms, you're gonna smell worse. I know that I heard this growing up and it provided extra incentive to keep shaving. But in reality, the few studies that have been done on this topic, and those are not wasteful studies, by the way, <laughs> they have shown that there is barely a difference between the odor of shavers and non-shavers. And this cleanliness theory also falls short because it's clearly divided based on gender. After all, if shaving your armpits was actually cleaner, then wouldn't all men be doing it too? Another proposed theory is that body hair removal is a form of societal manipulation, which pits masculinity and femininity as a strict binary with no overlap. This is what keeps men from doing ballet and women from playing football. It's part of the roots of homophobia and transphobia. This polarization has grave consequences for those who step outside their prescribed societal role. It discourages women from taking on masculine traits such as independence, assertion, analytical thinking, and yes, even hairiness. A final factor that is contributing to the perpetuation of hair removal is the tendency to consider men to be adults, but to group women together with children. After all, hairlessness is classically characteristic of children, and the growth of thick, coarse hair is a supernatural part of going through puberty. So when hairlessness is assigned to femininity, it's essentially equating femininity with childlike. This is further reinforced by the language surrounding hair removal. How many of you have seen an advertisement for shaving cream that promises to make your skin baby soft? Or have you ever thought about the number of desirable traits in women that are actually characteristic of children? No body fat, no wrinkles, petite, and definitely no hair. It's possible that this culture of body hair removal is actually one part of a larger culture that lumps women together with children and then accepts, even celebrates, the near pedophilic standards of adult men. So to recap, body hair removal was first perpetuated by advertisers capitalizing on the fashion of the day, then on the fear of social embarrassment, and finally on the basis of men's sexual pleasure. Today, the blame for continuing this trend lies on the porn industry and the modern media alike. But it is impossible to ignore that part of the blame lies on all of our shoulders. Now, I'm not saying that everyone sitting in this room needs to throw away their razor tonight. In fact, I do believe that both men and women should be able to shave if they want to, as long as they have recognized and evaluated the factors that led to their decision. What I am asking of those in the room is not to give up the razor. What I am asking is that you give up the stigma. Stop talking about women you see on the street who have hair on their legs and armpits. Stop staring at them in grocery stores, at parties, or at office hours. 
Stop labeling them as dirty and correct others when you hear them doing it. And if you aren't attracted to certain women because they happen to have hair on their legs, armpits, or anywhere else, then maybe it's time that you reevaluate your standards. I still look back on my 12-year-old self picking up the razor for the first time, but I actually prefer to think about my 19-year-old self giving up the razor for good, getting more time back in my day, and fighting against the societal norm that has us all tangled up. I will leave you with this. Shaving, waxing, or hair removal of any kind is not necessary or normal. Parents, teach this to your daughters, because that is where change really happens, from generation to generation. For almost 100 years, we have been taught an oppressive habit. Let's shed that burden, and maybe, just maybe, we can all grow a little more as a result. Thank you. Yeah.